But before we come to this, I, I still feel somewhat burdened by the last lecture, and I will, if you will indulge me, like to take just a moment to repeat it once again. I'm sure I've made the point uh, probably, probably more emphatically than was necessary, but since we don't usually think of the Lord's Prayer in terms of preceptive and decretive will, and since I think that is absolutely essential to a proper understanding of these petitions in the first part of it, let me take just a moment to say once again before we make our transition to the second part of the Lord's Prayer. When we say, after we have addressed the deity as our Father who art in heaven, when, when we actually say, hallowed be thy name, we mean hallowed be thy character, thy attributes. And that includes all the mercy, all the grace, all the love that there is in the divine nature, plus all the wrath and anger and judgment. Our God is love and our God is a consuming fire and we want him to be hallowed no less as a consuming fire than as a God of love. That is what we're saying in this matter of desiring the hallowing of God's name. Now, when we came to that other petition, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which is a veritable establishment of God's kingdom in the earth, what we're asking for there is that God's redeeming, merciful, delivering nature, which has its perfect fulfillment in heaven, where angels and justified men and women perfected in holiness obey all his commandments all the time in such a way that his decretive will and his preceptive will are one and the same. And as I say, that prayer we must continue to make even though it is not fulfilled completely in this world and will not be fulfilled until we come actually to heaven until the last saint is brought there. But at the same time, it is answered in the sense that we never make the prayer perfectly and the imperfect answer may be a perfect answer to the imperfect prayer of ours. But now to come to the second part of the Lord's Prayer where we are concerned not directly with God's glory but with our own particular needs. One, back to man and back to earth and earthly need, bread. That's usually the word. <laughs> it's, no, it's not necessarily the most common food. I guess the most common food in the world is rice and not uh, bread, but certainly for us in the Western world at least, bread is a synonym for food. It's almost the staff of life as we call it, and certainly it's just a synonym here for the sustaining of our earthly bodies. We are asking for what keeps us going physically as we participate in the divine being, hence the word bread. Two, as we noted, man by nature is and ever will be a body-soul creature. So though we envisage a time when in heaven we will not need bread. At the same time, even in heaven, we will be bodily beings. These present bodies are going to be raised. They're going to be adapted to a new environment and to an eternal existence. But at the same time, there's going to be a continuity. I would imagine something like bread would be necessary, as it were or there'd be some token at least by which God would indicate our bodily dependence upon him commensurate with our spiritual dependence upon him. Presumably not bread, but nevertheless, a body there adapted to eternity and some way sustained as a body, not confused though united with are perfected souls in that time. I think you see what I'm hinting at uh, there, just the feeling that this prayer, though it seems so earthbound, 
so inevitably linked to the daily needs of our present existence, probably it's a permanent prayer. Probably there'll be something like bread in the world to come because certainly we will have a bodily existence different from ours and pass through closed doors and move through space very rapidly, but still a body of some sort, so still presumably something that corresponds to bread here and now. Number three, but even as a spirit, he, man, needs daily spiritual bread. It's rather interesting that Mary Baker Eddy in her book in Christian Science talks, translates this as spiritual bread. She, they don't, of course, take the physical literally and have a somewhat spiritualized meaning even of bread in this world. But uh, while it may be inappropriate for the prayer we now ask, people who know there is such a thing as bread and know that they need to have it to live, the idea of something like a super substantial bread or a spiritual bread is also some need we'll have. It's perfectly true in the petitions that follow. We focus on our spiritual needs especially, but I'm just talking now about the mere sustenance of our being. We need food for the sustenance of our physical being, and we need divine grace for the sustenance of our spiritual being. In the psalm it says we are like the sheep in the pasture. We feed on God. He feeds us as he feeds them with grass. He feeds us with spiritual food. We can't live without it. We can't exist as spiritual beings without it, even in this world, nor will we be able in the world to come. We'll always be created beings who are dependent on God at every stage of our existence. All I mean here is that there'll be bodily and, there are bodily and spiritual needs now, but they will continue presumably in a somewhat altered form in the world which is to come because even we continue in an altered form, but still as basic body, soul beings. Number four. But the least spiritual of men realizes that their body needs daily material bread. That some people, you see, don't think at all about uh, spiritual things. That's far and away the most important thing about them. But many people live as if they were animals. The one thing they're really concerned about is to have enough bread and all these other creature comforts that go with it. That's the reason as we, we speculated and Paul's using the word flesh for our corrupt spiritual nature. It's a spiritual entity and not a bodily entity, but he calls it the flesh and I speculated on the fact that he does that because our spirit is so constantly subordinated to the needs of our inferior body. And so here I'm saying there are many people, unregenerate, non-Christian people, whose spirits really constitute their identity and who are far more important as minds and souls than they are as bodies. Nevertheless, they live as if they were merely bodies. They live as animals. And in that particular sphere, they can't live as well as animals. Animals have a fixed interest in one thing only, namely getting enough to eat. Whereas man should be concerned with other things, and when he behaves as an animal and is absorbed only in bodily needs, of course, he can't concentrate on that as successfully as animals who are only uh, bodies. It's a rather ironical thing, in other words, when a superior being such as man subordinates his superior soul to his inferior body, he becomes even inferior in his behavior to animal because they can meet bodily needs with much more concentration and satisfaction which he, than he can, and those bodily needs can never ultimately satisfy his soul. Number five, it is no sin to ask for things physical. 
In fact, it is a duty to pray daily for daily bread. As a pastor, I was always impressed uh, by the fact that, uh, that anything that had to do with a church building or salaries or costs of new chairs or something like that was always considered a rather business concern, necessary but really not a part of the spiritual job of the church. Even when you had a body of trustees, which was really a body for incorporation and relationship with the state, alongside of a session, the session, because it was concerned with the spiritual well-being of the church, was almost thought to be a superior sort of being because the trustees only had to do with the material or external or governmental aspects of the church. It was almost hard for the people to think of the trustees as spiritual servants of Christ as they could easily and naturally think of the session. Now, of course, it is perfectly true. These people did have a more concrete material concern. These had spiritual concerns as well. But the point was, a man could have been more godly serving as a trustee than someone else serving as an elder. I mean, you serve God with all your heart, whatever the sphere may be. And these two are integrally related, and the trustee job for Christ is a spiritual job as truly as a session job would be. And there's no reason to sort of apologize and talk about ministers' salaries or about building an annex or about um, whether we can get a uh, full-time secretary, whether we can afford the cost and all that. That's a legitimate concern. But I mean, to feel while you're talking about those things, that somehow or other you're saying, pardon me, Lord, I have to deal with these things for the moment. I know that's not your concern, but these things have to be taken care of. No, no, no. You're serving the Lord there as truly as you are here. Even though you're more immediately concerned with the matters of the kingdom, you are nevertheless a member of the kingdom seeking to do God's will on earth as it is done in heaven in corresponding situations. Now, it's no sin to ask for things physical. In fact, it is a duty to pray daily for daily bread. While I'm on that subject, some ministers wrestle with the question, they get a bigger salary at another church and so on, as to whether that could be a legitimate concern in their considering the call or possible call to another church. Of course it can be a legitimate consideration. It's not the only consideration. And to decide God wants you to go to a certain place before, because it will give you more income is not the only factor, but it could be the decisive factor. There's certainly nothing wrong in earning an income or earning a greater income rather than a lesser income. You don't need to be ashamed of considering these things. You could be ashamed of considering them unduly. You can abuse something. But the idea that talking about money or talking about physical things, talking about bread, is somehow or other beneath a spiritual Christian. Well, our minds are disabused of that immediately because the very first petition in these group of petitions concerning our human need has to do with existence needs. We are told to pray for our daily bread. We can't get along without it. And probably Billy... Uh, D.L. Moody was right when he said nobody was ever converted on an empty stomach. What he meant by that, it was a kind of justification for a church carrying on a ministry in food, clothing, and other kind of concrete material help, including financial help, and so on, partly to have people pay attention to the gospel which has produced this charity and this love and so on. A person can't be converted on an empty stomach. Oh, he could be, but he certainly will listen more openly to the presentation of the gospel when through us he received his daily bread. Though obviously, bread is not non-spiritual. It isn't unrelated to the spiritual undertaking of the Christian church 
and its being necessary to our very existence makes it very necessary to us in this world for our spiritual existence as well. Number six, bread is a gift of the spirit who needs no bread, but makes us spirits who do need bread. Here again, an obvious observation, but worth bearing in mind just the same. The Spirit of God needs no bread. He is mere spirit. Only the Son has taken upon himself a human nature and a human body, which needed bread here below, as well as we do ourselves. But it was a spirit who gave us this body, which needs bread, and it's the same Spirit of God who leads us to pray for our daily bread. In other words, our spirits need bread, and our spirits are taught to pray for bread. It isn't our bodies which ask for bread. Our bodies need the bread, but it's our spirits which ask for the bread which our body needs. So you can see immediately there is a spiritual and activity involved in praying for our daily bread because it is the spirit, the body which has the need, but it's the spirit which voices the need to God the Spirit who gives us the materials to meet the needs of our body. Number seven, undoubtedly, he made us daily dependent so we'd daily, constantly be in communion with the Spirit who made us and feeds us. It's a very good thing to have our daily bread. And how fortunate it is when we have the kind of abundance and affluence which we enjoy in these United States. We are deeply grateful for that. But what I'm calling attention to in number seven is the benefit that is to our souls. It forces us, no matter how apathetic we are, or at what low ebb we may be spiritually, our recurring daily need of food, the hunger which is an inseparable part of us, leads us to pray. It's pretty easy to ignore our almost starvation condition spiritually. We may have a famine of the Word of God and not be aware of it, but you'll never have a famine of food without being aware of it. You get what I'm driving at? Here's another one of these beautiful divine tricks, divine manipulations, divine technique by means of which through plain, ordinary bread, God makes his children spiritual warriors. He makes it impossible for us to live without prayer, no matter how low our spiritual life level may be because we have to have bread. We can't live without bread. And we got to have our bread except for praying for it. We want a bread which is given to us by God. The grocer is the means, but he is not the ultimate source. It's God who gives us the bread through the grocer. And it's therefore an act of grace to pray for it. It's an act of grace to receive it. It's an act of grace to consume it. As I say, it's a word of grace so efficient that it makes it impossible for a Christian person to live without praying or to have a bodily need without supplying it by spiritual activity. Number eight, Charles Lamb once wrote that he didn't feel very grateful for daily bread, for he earned that, he said. He should have been doubly grateful that he received it by being able to work for it. What, what Lamb said on this occasion is that when I receive a book that I haven't written, I feel very grateful. I can honestly say I thank thee for this book. I didn't have anything to do with the production of it, but it has enriched me greatly. But I don't feel that way when I sit down to a meal which I have bought with money I have earned by my work and so on. But what I say to Charles Lamb is, he ought to have been with me on some of my pastoral visits 
to a man who, because of some kind of incapacity, was not able to work. Oh, what he wouldn't have given to be able to do a day's work. He still had enough money, and he was getting supplemental income, but oh, how he missed his job. He'd give anything to be able to work. I say, Charles Lamb, if you were ever with me on a visit like that, you would thank God doubly for your daily bread. Once for the bread, and secondly, because you were able to earn it. That is a blessing even greater, perhaps, than the bread itself. A very foolish thing to say. I don't feel like saying thanks for my daily bread because I earned it. I say thanks twice for my daily bread because I earned it. God enabled me to earn it. He didn't just give it to me. He let me have the privilege of working for it. How doubly grateful I actually am for such a blessing. Number three, as a pastor, I've seen many who receive daily bread they are not able to work for. How they wish they could earn it. Number 10, what a delight to have an animal eat out of our hands. We even have little zoos like that for the children, you know, where they can hand something to a goat or to a monkey or to some other animal who come close enough to eat. I remember the burned bears and burned Switzerland. They didn't come close enough. They were in a little pit there and so on, but they did everything but say thank you when we throw things down to them and so on. But it certainly is a delight, not just for kids, but I guess none of us grows up in the sense of getting free of the delight we have and this intimate relationship with animals and especially when we can give them something that they like so much and so on. Well, what I'm saying here in this tenth and final point is this. God made us spiritual animals who can only eat out of His hands. We sit down to our daily meal, and it's just as if God was taking that food and holding it up to us, and we were literally eating it out of His hands. just the way we would feed an animal, just the way we would get a satisfaction out of it. I'm not forgetting we're spiritual beings. I'm not romanticizing animals, but you know what I do mean by the feeling of intimacy with the lower creatures. And when you come up to talk about lower and higher, there's a far greater difference between God and us than there is between us and animals. He is infinitely exalted above us and we eat everything out of his hand, not just our daily bread. This book comes right straight down from heaven to us. His Spirit is within us, teaching us what this verse means and how to understand that and how to see the interrelation between them and so on. He's just literally leading us by the hand along the whole path. But it seems to me this whole figure of praying Give us this day our daily bread is a device of God by which he gets us to eat out of his hand. And we can visualize it and understand it because we know we wouldn't have any bread unless he gave it to us. And it's absolutely realistic to say we're eating it out of his hand and we're dependent upon him three times a day just to keep alive. You're quite sure he's made us with bodies for that reason. And we're grateful to God we have bodies that need bread so that we have to pray daily for bread and that when it comes, it comes from God. Through the grocer, but from God. And we are in a very wonderful way eating out of God's hand. You can see now as we say goodbye to this petition, give us this day our daily bread and move into the, what I would call, more serious but hardly more spiritual needs of forgiveness and deliverance from evil as we're kept from temptation, that even this very first petition, which is so straightforwardly concerned with our bodily needs, the very staff of life itself, is far from being non-spiritual. 
The more you think of it, the more you realize it is a profound means of grace. It is a, an unfailing way of bringing us to the divine trough, shall we say, for blessing three times every day and making it utterly impossible for us to live without being men and women of prayer. Now, what I want you to remember as you think about this meditation in the future, that though this is very physical, very bodily, and it is talking not about any super substantial bread or any transcendental bread or any spiritual bread, but plain, ordinary wheat bread. It's talking about bread that we have to have for the sustenance of our being, but it is inseparably connected with the sustenance of our spiritual being. It's immediately directed to food that we have to have for our body, but we have to get this food by a spiritual exercise of prayer and a spiritual exercise of gratitude and a spiritual exercise of communion as we eat the bread, as it were, right out of God's hand.